Uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining me today. This is a great venue. This is like, uh, I mean, normally we're in a hotel, like, conference room or a ballroom or something, and it's like the most stale environment ever. Like, this is, uh, this is a really nice change of pace. Uh, and thanks again to Johnny for putting this all together and PJ and, uh, and the people that seem to be doing the most amount of work, which is Johnny's family. Uh, so thanks to them too. And uh, I was telling some of these other guys that like literally Girl Scouts can come to my house twice a day and I'm gonna buy cookies like every single time. So like thanks for having the cookies here. It actually was really I mean, those little shortbread cookies are just, I mean, they're the bomb. So, all right. Um, yeah, so thanks, everybody. Uh, this is a presentation I'm calling a deep dive into Hex. So Hex is a tool that I bet everyone or almost everyone in this room has used, but probably not too many of you have given a whole lot of thought to it. Um, my alternate title was, wait, it's more than mixed depths get. Uh, and. Uh, Laugh? Come on. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, tough crowd. But, uh, no, we don't have mics in here, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, get that in post, OK? <laughs> um, um, so yeah, for most of us, like mixed steps get is about the closest we get to Hex. And we, uh, we take advantage of the fact that Hex is just going to do its thing, and it's always going to work. And uh, I think that's one of the, the parts of Hex as a package manager that uh, that excites me is the fact that it really just does its thing and it, it doesn't really make a nuisance of itself. Um, so introduce myself. Uh, my name is Todd Rezadek. I'm a senior software engineer at Weedmaps. Uh, we're a primarily Elixir uh, operation at this point, although we still have some Ruby stuff. And, uh, and we are currently hiring. So if anybody's interested, let one of us know. I think there's six of us here today. Um, so we're looking for people with experience in Elixir and some people that maybe don't have a lot of production experience or any, but have a, an interest in it. Uh, so just let us know, talk to us, and you know we'll, we'll give you some more information. Online, you can find me at Super Simple or some derivative thereof, like on Twitter with no vowels. Um, so in, you know, by all means, like find me on online or find me like after the conference or after the talk. I like to meet new people, and you know this is a good crowd of people. So, uh, so yeah, let's let's be friends. All right. So, um, what is Hex? So let's define it first. So Hex is the package manager for the Erlang ecosystem. So it's analogous to what Ruby Gems is for Ruby, or Crates is for Rust, or npm for Node. All right. Where did it come from? It came from Sweden. Uh, this guy, Eric Meadows Johnson. Is the uh, is the author of it, and it was released in December of 2013. So, um, you know, a little bit after Jose released the first version of Elixir. So, um, how how would we compare it to some of those other package managers? So, one way would be the amount of libraries that are available. So, Hex has right now about 6,000 uh, packages available. Ruby Gems has about 9,200. And let's see, crates is about 14,000, which uh, if anybody's interested in crates, come find me after this because uh, I think that's actually a really great piece of software too. Um, and NPM, yeah. I, like, I feel like I should comment on that number, but like everybody sees that and realizes how ridiculous that is. Um, so. The only thing I'll say about that is suffice it to say that quantity and quality aren't always the same thing. Uh, sometimes they're mutually exclusive, in fact. So um, uh, I'm sure there are 6,000 really good NPM packages. <laughs> so uh, and just to give you some idea of like where these, uh, like where the growth is happening. Um, so since Hex hit uh, the 5,000 mark, so. In the, uh, in the time that Hex gained 1,000 packages, Ruby Gems gained about 400 packages. Um, and so I've been tracking this for about the last year and definitely seen what looks like and people maybe moving over to, you know, evidence of people moving over to Hex or maybe just, maybe just 9,200 is like the magic number of valuable libraries 
in Ruby Gems, and uh, and Hex is still catching up. Um, but uh, so why why would you want to know more about Hex? Basically, so some ideas would be to uh, work faster, uh, to prevent issues from happening, or to debug a little bit easier. Um, and I'll I'll explain on those a little bit later. So here's the anatomy of a Hex package, and you'll notice it looks a lot like any other Mix project. Um, the one thing I would say is, is maybe a little bit different is the license markdown file. And you won't find that in every hex package. Um, but just keep in mind that like one of the, the rules of hex is that if you release your package under a specific open source license, that you have to include this file in there with the complete text of that license. Uh, so just keep that in mind if anybody's like thinking about making a hex package. Um, everybody can read that, right? All right, uh, ju just kidding. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, this is the uh, mix file for a, a common hex package. So um, you know it's going to look, again, like most other mix projects. Uh, I just want to point out a couple things. So the version, uh, versioning is required to be semantic, which you know hopefully you're doing that anyway. But just keep that in mind that hex requires semantic versioning. Um, the description which is in there. Uh, this is a really important piece of data for a hex package because this is one of the two fields that's actually searchable. So if somebody's looking for a package that does a certain thing or has a certain name, uh, this is one of the, the two places where that text can exist uh, and it's gonna come up in search results. It's also what everybody's gonna see on hex PM. So when they go there and they try to figure out is this the package that I need to use, um, this description is really what's, you know, make it or break it on that. Uh, the depths, which this is kind of like inception because this is a package requiring packages. Um, and this isn't hex specific, but I think there's some things in here that relate to hex that a lot of people, especially newer people, don't know. And that's the fact that you can load uh, these dependencies from a bunch of different sources. So probably the most commonly uh, it is to load it right from hex. Uh, but if you can see, like on the second one, that's loading in from GitHub. So that's instead of going out to hex PM and retrieving that package, uh, it's going right to a GitHub URL for that. Or you can include a, a path. And um, so that just points to your local system. So the reasons why you'd want to do that would be, A, it's a library that you don't think is very useful to anybody else, or it contains proprietary information that you don't want to open source and put out into the world, or B, uh, maybe you're developing a hex package and you want to test it locally um, as a dependency. So you don't have to push it up to hex as an you know, unfinished or untested um, package. You can load it in as um, under the path uh, flag and, and test it from your local. Uh, the package, so this uh, package section of the, the mix file is for hex and the Important thing to look at here is the name. So that's the other uh, form of data that's searchable on hex. And that's essentially what your package is called. So when people say, you know, I downloaded the cowboy package, uh, if you look in there, the package name on that is literally just cowboy. Um, and sorry, the last one, which is you may see or you may not see sometimes, is the organization. And um, does anybody here have a hex organization set up? Like raise your hand or we got, we got one. I know we, weed maps, we do, so a uh, couple. So uh, organizations are private repositories. So it's like hex PM that's uh, sheltered from the rest of the world. So if you're pulling in your package or you're publishing your package uh, to a private repo, um, this organization will set and that's gonna tell it what organization it belongs to. All right, um, package naming. So um, I want to read this verbatim. There's only one rule in hex about naming your packages, and it's this. Avoid using offensive or harassing package names, nicknames, or other identifiers that might detract from a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all. Um, and I want to read that verbatim just because I think it is really important. And you can probably think of other uh, ecosystems where the uh, um, Maybe the main contributors or the, just the community in general is not very inclusive. And you know it turns into like this flame war 4chan sort of a thing. And um, 
I think Elixir, Jose, and Eric, in this case, have done a really, have been really proactive about making sure that uh, everything that happens in our community is made to be really friendly. And uh, you know, if you've ever looked at the pull requests that people make on Elixir, uh, on the Elixir Lang repo, um, you know, Jose's always putting unicorn emojis and hearts and stuff in there. It's never like, uh, hey, you're a beginner or noob, like this is totally wrong. It's always meant to be really encouraging. And, uh, and so again, like this follows along that same theme. And, and uh, again, I just wanted to reiterate it because I think it's really important that we keep our community uh, as inclusive as possible. Jeff, thank you. I, I mean, it really, it is, it can't be understated, the fact that like we might have this great programming language, but if the community devolves, um, you know, we're gonna lose smart people, uh, new people, and it's, I mean, it's eventually it's just gonna atrophy, so. Um, so yeah, now there's only one hard rule for naming, but there are conventions, and uh, so one of them is when you're adding functionality to an existing package, use that package's name in your package name. So for instance, if you're building an authorization tool that goes on top of plug, uh, you'd want to name your, your package something like plug auth so that people know that like this is an addition to plug, um, you know, just so that's very clear. So uh, in a, and in this case, you'd want to avoid namespace conflicts. So if, you're, if you are making plug auth, for instance, your module shouldn't be called plug.auth because that's encroaching into plug's namespace. So call it plug auth, um, camel case. That should be um, the namespace that, that you use for your package. Um, and this, this one, I think Johnny disagrees with this one, but I think it's kind of the convention is when, uh, when porting a library from another ecosystem, it's typical that you're gonna add EX to the name. So um, for instance, like the faker gem is, I think it's called X faker, um, but you'll commonly see like if it's a, sorry, hex package. So uh, you'll commonly look for like a Ruby gem that you know of by name, it's gonna have that same name underscore EX or EX underscore that name. Um, and that's just a kind of a common indicator that this is functionality that you're used to in this other ecosystem, but this is version is in Elixir. Um, and names are first come, first serve. So there's no preference given to trademark holders on names. So for instance, if you, um, if you decide, hey, look, Spotify doesn't have an API wrapper um, available on Hex, I'm gonna write one, uh, you're totally able to call your package Spotify. You don't have to change the name or you know, Spotificate or whatever. Um, there's no uh, mandate from the Hex community that, that you give deference to the trademark holder. Um, having said that, name squatting isn't allowed in Hex. So um, we, uh, for instance, if, if take the Spotify example, if you say like, oh, I'm gonna build that Spotify API like tomorrow, so I'm just gonna put up some trivial package now to sort of stake my claim on the name. Um, you know how that goes, like tomorrow turns into next week and then that's next month and then it's six months from now and you still haven't really built the Spotify package. Um, so in those cases, if there's anything trivial, uh, if there's a package that's deemed to be trivial, the administrators of Hex will just take it down. Um, all right, so what Hex commands should you know? And this is the first section which I call works on my machine. and. Uh, I, this is what I always tell our QA team, and they, which is, they love. Uh, so the first one is mix hex info. Uh, and most of these I'm gonna go over are mix tasks, so I might just leave off the mix. But hex info, uh, just type that into your terminal. It's gonna tell you what version of hex you have installed, what version of Elixir, which version of OTP, and then it's gonna tell you what it was built with. And then also at the bottom, it's gonna tell you if there's a newer version available. So why would you want to know that? Let's say if you're having a problem, but your coworker isn't having that problem with the dependency, uh, it may be that you're on different versions. So it may be that a conflict exists or a bug exists in your version, but not in their version. Um, so this would be maybe the first step to diagnose that. Uh, now, if you add a uh, package name to it, so hex info and then package name, um, you're going to get the most recent description for that package. Uh, you're going to get the most recent releases, so up to eight of them. If there's more than eight, it'll show an ellipsis. 
Um, and you'll see it like on this one, the first one is 2.0 RC1, the last one is 010, and that's in yellow and it's marked as retired. I'll talk about retired packages towards the end of this, um, but that's useful information to know. And then the config line is what hex recommends you put in your depths. Um, so in this case, you'll see that it says, it recommends the 1.0 in, in your depths. So you say like, why not the latest version, the 2.0? Um, hex looks at the version numbers and when it sees that dash at the end, regardless of what comes after it, it assumes that that's a pre-release version. So in this, the, what you'll commonly see is RC, which would be a release candidate, or you'll see pre um, after that. But it can literally be anything. The internals of, of hex just look for a dash. Um, and so uh, in this case, hex isn't going to recommend you install a pre-release or a release candidate um, as a dependency for obvious reasons. So it'll show you the latest stable version. Uh, and that happens in a few places in hex. So just keep that in mind. And going further, one step further, if you add a release number, so hex info package, then version, it's going to give you specifics about that particular release. Uh, in this case, it includes the dependencies that that package has. Uh, and so this could be really useful for figuring out why maybe your lock file isn't updating. So maybe you have a, a conflicting requirement on a common dependency. Uh, so you might say, like, why can't, you know, Hackney is, is locked at 1.1 one, one here. Let's say that you have another package that uses Hackney 2, which I don't think exists, but let's just say it does. Uh, requires Hackney 2, and you'll do your mixed apps update, and you'll find out, like, why isn't it updating to, to uh, Hackney 2? Well, this is why you have a, a dependency in there that, in your dependency tree that's locked at, at the one, one point version. All right, section two, learning. All right, so um, now you want to learn more about hex packages. So you can just go in your CLI, just type in hex search, and then a search term. And it's going to bring up, right there, it's going to bring up uh, packages that match th that result. So uh, in this case, the search is always limited to 100 results. Usually, you're going to get just a handful back that match. Uh, the version number that's shown there is the latest stable version. So it doesn't show pre, it doesn't show release candidates. Um, you can do a multi-word search by using a plus um, and joining, joining the words with a plus. But just keep in mind right now that's an inclusive search. Uh, or sorry, it's, yes, it's an inclusive search, uh, meaning that it will match on either term, not something that matches both terms. Um, and behind the scenes, this is just a logical, um, an or join on a Postgres I like. Uh, and so there are plans uh, in the repo to put in a more robust search um, system, like an Elasticsearch or React, something like that that can maybe do a little bit more. But for right now, this is, this is what Hex does. Um, all right, this is the cool stuff. So uh, Hex docs online and then a package. Um, the, this section I'm going to show you is uh, only available in 0.17.4. So right now, uh, unless you're on master, you're probably not running that yet. But since it's coming out really soon, I, I wanted to focus on the changes that are in 17.4 rather than give this talk today and then next week have it be uh, made obsolete. So hex docs online and then a package um, is going to load up the documentation on hex docs for that package. Uh, the exceptions uh, or some caveats in this is that if the package that you um, that you're asking for is one of these in this list. Uh, it's going to look at the version that matches your current Elixir version. So by default, it's going to give you the latest uh, latest docs or the latest release docs. But if you're, let's say, if you're running Elixir 1.5, for instance, if you type in hex docs online Elixir, it's going to bring up the docs for 1.5, um, not the newest version, which I think is 1.62. So and the uh, so if you're in an, in the context of a mix app and you type this in, if that package is included as one of your dependencies, it's going to open up the version that you have installed. So uh, again, like another package, uh, it's not just going to give you the latest. It's going to be smart. It's going to look into your your project, see that you're using X Y Z version, and it's going to load the docs up for that automatically. 
And if none of those, neither of those things is true, it's just going to default to the latest version. Uh, and I mean, this is basically what you're going to see is the Hexdocs website with the, uh, you know, the documentation that you're used to. So if you, uh, if you add a version to that, uh, so Hexdocs online package version, then it is going to pick up just that version of it. Um, so a corollary to that is Hexdocs fetch. Uh, this is actually in 17.3, so you could use this right away. Um, what this does is, let's say you have a, a commute coming up. Let's say you're, you're on a train where you don't get internet access or you're taking a plane, uh, but you want to read documentation for this new package that you're checking out or possibly a package that is uh, installed in your system that you just want to learn more about. Use Hexdocs fetch. It's going to go out to, um, it's going to go out to Hexdocs and pull down all the documentation files for that and install it on your computer. Uh, so, um, if you if you don't include a package name on this right now, it's going to download all the docs for all the dependencies in your project. So, in the context of a of a mixed project, let's say you have a hundred dependencies in there in your dependency tree. You type in hex docs fetch. It's going to go ahead and download all 100 of those. Put those on your local system so you have them. So you can archive them. You can you know read them offline. Whatever you want to do with them. Um, and so if it's called outside of an app without a package name, this is just going to raise an error. So you can see like this is one that I I did on one of my projects, and you could just see brrr, it's downloading all these packages. There's a if, if it runs into one where there's no documentation exists, so uh, like Cowboy, for instance, publishes their documentation in a different place, so um, that's one of those that you're not going to be able to download documentation for. Um, but in this case, Fetch will just skip over those and move on to the next one. Uh, so if you add the package name, it's going to download the documentation to your home folder, your hex home folder. So if you look right now in your, uh, in your home, uh, there's a .hex directory, if you have hex installed. And inside, there's going to be a bunch of files. So one of those is the docs directory. So anytime you do a fetch, all that stuff is going to go into there. Um, let's see. So here we go. Hex docs offline package. This is kind of the machination of online and fetch at the same time. So what this is going to do is look in your hex home folder for any downloaded documentation. If it's there, it's going to open it up in a browser and serve it up from your file system. No internet required. Um, if it's not there, it's going to download it from Hexdocs and then open it up in your browser being served from your local file system. So obviously, you have to download it once. Um, but in this case, uh, it does the fetch and the open at the same time. And then, then you have it in perpetuity on your, on your computer. Um, if you add the latest flag to any of those, it's going to skip all those other rules and just give you the latest version. Um, you can add that to the fetch, offline, or the online tasks. And uh, like I said, it overrides any of that other logic that I talked about. All right, section three, get ready. I'm going to let this run because this is like one of the best. All day. All right. <laughs> Whoa. All right. Um, this is sort of a more of the mundane stuff about Hex, so I'm going to go through it kind of quickly, but it's important to do because some of the features of Hex can't be done until you do this stuff. So uh, Hex user register. So uh, you just type that in to your CLI or to your, uh, to your terminal, and you're going to get a few prompts. So it's going to ask you to set a username. It's going to ask you for a unique email address, and then to set your account password. Um, you're going to need that to do, like I said, do a few of the things that are available on Hex. It's going to require you to, to establish a user. Um, and once you do this, it's going to send you an email to confirm that address. So before it'll work, check your email box. Um, the only rules to this, the username must be at least three characters in length. And it can contain letters, numbers, and a limited number of symbols. So underscores, hyphens, periods, and parens only. Uh, so reset password local. So um, in Hex, there's two passwords and kind of two accounts. There's one on your local system that's encrypted and one that's on uh, in the Hex uh, online system, so Hex PM. Uh, those are two separate accounts with two separate passwords, same username. 
so reset password local, it's gonna give you a prompt to uh, reset your local password. That's actually stored in this file here, so in your hex home, hex.config file um, as encrypted key, that's the name of it. Um, it's encrypted using the A256 CBC algorithm, um, but there's plans, as soon as OTP 17 support is dropped, it's gonna jump to A256 GCM, uh, which admittedly I know very little about, uh, but I think it's better. Uh, I mean, why would they switch it? It's not better. So, uh, um, so yeah, reset password account. Uh, that's going to send you an email. So this is your uh, your hex PM user. This is going to send you an email to reset. It's going to give you a link to the hex PM website to do all the the setting of new passwords. Um, when you do this, it may invalidate all of your locally stored API keys. Uh, and so um, you can see those if you type in hex user key dash dash list. It's going to show you all the uh, the API keys that you have set up on your local user. So in this case, I have my local user, super simple. I've got my personal organization and I've got uh, Weed Maps organization set up. Um, so if you ever want to revoke one of those, get rid of those keys, hex user key revoke, and then the key name, it's going to just get rid of one of those keys. Uh, so if you, you know, kill your organization, if you leave the company, whatever, um, you know, you can just take that housekeeping, clean that up. Um, if you do dash dash revoke all, it's going to remove all those. So um, like I was saying, when you reset your password on hex PM, it is going to or may invalidate all those keys, keys that you have stored. So generally when you reset your password, you're going to do this. You're going to revoke all. Clear them all out uh, so that you can refresh them. And you do that with hex user auth. Hex user auth is going to uh, regenerate all the locally stored API keys. So rebuild. Um, hex config. So since I mentioned it, your, uh, your password is stored in here. Um, also, some particular configurations that you have if you want to modify how hex works on your system. So uh, if you look in that file, hex.config, um, you're going to see this, well, something like this, and uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but just keep in mind that's where uh, your hex config exists, so um, if you're having problems related to config, it may be this file got corrupted or it got lost or uh, something like that. So um, you can technically add any config key you want to that file and it will save it, but hex will just ignore it basically. So mix hex config key. Uh, we'll show you what the value of that, that config is. Um, and the, uh, so y like I said, you can use any key you want, uh, but the ones that Hex looks at are these eight. And uh, the one that I think most of these are used if you're going to set up your own private Hex repository, so outside of the Hex and Hex PM organizations, um, most of these are, are, are settings that you use for that. The one I'd say that is possibly useful to the rest of us is the HTTP concurrency. Um, Hex is designed right now to uh, concurrently go out and fetch eight, um, eight or send eight requests at a time. So when you do a fetch, it's going to send out eight calls basically at once. Um, if you find that you're getting like race condition type issues um, or maybe you have a billion dependencies and it's going too slow, you can increase or decrease that number. Um, I think, you know, do that at your own risk, basically. Ec um, the default is eight, and that seems to work well for most people. But I'd say, again, just keep in mind that it's there. Uh, so, um, and again, like, if you add a value to the end, so hex config key value, it's going to set or reset that particular config key, or dash dash delete, it's going to remove an existing key. All right, uh, this section I call defense. Uh, and so this is uh, this is kind of defending your app. Um, so hex dot outdated, and what this is is basically an audit of your dependencies. Um, and this is going to look at it's going to list all your primary dependencies, what version they're currently on, what version is the latest, and then if there's an upgrade path available. Uh, so in this case, I'm on zero one zero, which is deprecated. The latest version is one zero three. Uh, update is not possible on that. It's a major version change. 
Um, however, on Earmark, I'm only a patch version behind. So get the big green yes. So that means uh, you know it's totally safe to upgrade that dependency. And in this case, xdocs is up to date, so green light on that. Um, if you add the dash dash all flag to this, it's going to search the entire dependency tree. So um, just because you see three dependencies here, each of these three dependencies might have three dependencies of their own and so on and so forth. So you may end up with you know, 15 or 18 dependencies in your dependency tree. Uh, if you want to check all of them, dash dash all will work. Um, and if you, the latest version there, like I said before, is going to be the latest stable version. If you're willing to use pre-releases, uh, you can add a dash dash pre flag, and that will show you uh, the latest version, including pre-releases, release candidates. Um, and so add a package name to that, hex dash outdated, or hex dot outdated package. Um, it'll show all the dependencies that that particular package has, so that branch of the tree, and, uh, and if there's upgrades available. And the next part of being defensive about your application is to do an audit. So uh, you probably, or if you're a Ruby programmer, you've probably done like a bundle audit before, or something like that, and uh, this is similar to that. So hex.audit is going to show you any retired packages uh, that you have installed. So in this case, it found one. Uh, it tells you the reason for that as well. Um, so this is a you know housekeeping thing to keep your dependencies up to date so they're more reliable. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about retirement in just a second. All right, contributing. Little, little, little something. Uh, Lil Wayne, right? Lil Wayne? Yeah? Okay. Whew, I'm getting confused. All right, uh, they're all Lil. I don't know. All right, hex publish. Uh, is anybody here just shout it out if you've ever published a hex package before? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, so that's great. Um, so a couple of things. It requires you to be a registered hex user. So we talked about registering a user. Uh, so hex.publish, the command, generates and publishes your documents by default. Uh, if you add a dash dash organization flag, it will publish those to the private organization. Uh, that's not necessary if you put organization in your mix file. So um, if you put organization in your mix file, it automatically does this. If you don't, you can add the flag this way. Um, and uh, don't, one other caveat to mention about this is watch out for pre-release dependencies. So when you go to publish a package, it's going to get rejected if you have any dependencies in your package that are pre-release. Um, and the exceptions to that would be if you're publishing it to a private organization, uh, they'll let you get away with it, or if the version that you're publishing is also a pre-release or a release candidate, uh, then your dependencies can be release candidates as well. Um, typo squatting, another great security feature of Hex. So um, we talked about name squatting, typo squatting, also good. So whenever you publish a package, um, on the back end, Hex looks at the name of that package, compares it to every other known package name, and uh, does a Levenstein uh, distance calculation on it. So uh, the distance right now, according to Eric, is two. So if, the, if your Levenstein distance is two or less, it's going to send out emails to the Hex admins uh, as sort of raising a flag for them. They're going to look at it and determine if it's a bona fide name. So maybe it just happens to be a short name, uh, or maybe it's, uh, it's, it's bona fide and these two things just happen to be very similarly named. Um, but it's also a, just a really good opportunity for them to take advantage of uh, or protect you against typo squatters. So if they say, like, no, this is totally illegitimate, it's really just taking advantage of people who misspelled XYZ, they're going to remove it from the, from the repository. Um, the exception to this, if you're publishing to an organization, uh, Hex doesn't check for the Levenstein distance. So it's organization is your little world. You do whatever you want with it. Um, OK, so let's say you just published something and you realized, oh, man, I totally forgot this, or uh, you know, I forgot, oh, it didn't compile well, or X, whatever reason. Um, you can do hex.publish, revert, dash dash revert, and then the version, and uh, it's going to unrelease it for you. 
Um, now, this is only available within the first hour of publishing. And, uh, you know, what, this is a really nice security feature. So I'm going to just say left pad and watch everybody cringe. And basically, this is the response to left pad. So um, once a publish is packaged in, or once a uh, package is published in hex, it's basically immutable. That release exists in that state in perpetuity. Um, as long as it's been there for at least an hour. Um, and so there can't be a left pad issue where all of a sudden somebody pulled this dependency down and you're trying to build your system and what, what the heck happened. Um, so hex protects us against that. Make sure that something like that can never happen. Um, now if you, if you notice an error in your documentation, don't worry about it. Uh, that, is, that follows a different set of rules. Uh, so the immutability is, only applies to um, the compiled package itself. Uh, so if you type in mix.publish docs, it's only going to publish the docs in that, that case. Uh, and so if you, uh, if you had to make a change in your documentation, if you noticed an error, you can do this anytime after uh, the package has been released. And uh, so there's no lim one hour limitation on that. And uh, um, yeah, so I mean, that should encourage you to not have to push out a new release just to push out better documentation. So hopefully encourage you to, to uh, make your documentation better. All right, uh, hex.retire. So you have a package and you no longer support it. Let's say you're just not interested in that project anymore. You're not supporting it. Let's say there's a particular release that relied on um, you know, one dependency and you've taken that out um, or you don't want to support uh, Elixir 1.3 anymore, you can retire that package. And that doesn't change that immutability law. It's still going to be available in perpetuity. Um, but what's it get, what it's going to do is raise a flag anytime somebody uses that, uh, that you've just required a dependency that's been retired. Um, there's five valid reasons that, I shouldn't say that. There's five reasons uh, that you'd be retiring a package. So one would be renamed. So when you, when you uh, retire a package, formally what you'll do is mix hex.retire uh, package version reason uh, and then message. So in this case, the reason would be you've renamed it, and in which case you should include the new name of the package in the message. Uh, you've deprecated it. If there's a replacement, include that in the message. Uh, security, so you found a security vulnerability. It's invalid, meaning uh, usually means it doesn't compile, or other. So other is everything else, and obviously you want to use the message to uh, to clarify like what the reason is for that. Uh, so here's an example of retiring, and you can also unretire packages. So like Michael Jordan, unretire, and then retire again. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> All right. Um, organizations. So uh, organizations were added in 0.17.1, which was just released uh, not even six months ago. It's still in private beta, so you can sign up for it on the HexPM website. Um, it's generally available. It's just not really advertised, I guess. Um, and it was supposed to be released this quarter, so it should be released pretty soon in, in, uh, in earnest. And you should expect there will be a uh, pricing per user on that. So the last price I saw being floated around is about $8 a user. Um, and uh, I think I've described this pretty well already, but organizations are like your own private uh, firewalled version of hex PM, so stuff that just you and your team can see. Um, this is the example interface. So if you go to hex PM right now, if you have an organization, like this is what you're going to see. You can add people from your team to your organization. You can add packages to your organization. And um, when you join an, uh, an organization, you just have to type this command in, hex organization auth, and then the name. Uh, it's going to um, authorize your local user uh, for that organization. So when you go to pull dependencies, it's going to see that you validated for that. It's going to allow you to pull dependencies from that organization. Uh, hex organization list is going to just show all the organizations that you are currently authorized for. 
All right, finally, join in. So, uh, I mean, Hex really is, it's an open source project, so it really wouldn't be anything without the people that are working on it. Um, and so, you know, get involved with it. So you star or follow the repo on GitHub, uh, submit an issue. If you think of a feature or if you find a bug, submit an issue on there uh, so we can work on it. Uh, or open a pull request to fix a current issue. So um, I know, you know, I've done a few of these. Uh, Ivan, is Ivan here? Ivan has done a lot of work on the Hex PM side of things. So those are two separate repos. And uh, the team behind that, uh, Wojtek and Eric, are, you know, like Jose, they're really, really nice people. So they appreciate the fact, I mean, you can imagine there's these people that are willing to build my software for free from all over the world. So they're, they're really, really polite about it. And, um, you know, if there's something that you're not doing well or if you're just learning Elixir, uh, their comments are usually really friendly and, uh, you know, they're willing to help you go in the right direction. Uh, and that's it. So I want to thank Weed Maps. They're the people that pay me to be here. And Elixir Days again. And if you're interested, that's the uh, GitHub for Hex. Uh, thanks, everybody. <laughs>